<laughs> Friends, we've come to this final session. There's a bit of a reversal in the in the direction of this because the one we had this morning is so long that trying to fit it into an hour would be difficult. So we are going to switch that. So we're coming to the penultimate section of I think the way the book was, I don't know how the book was printed out and how it came. In any case, this is this section, let's see, 91 is it? Yes, 91, section 91 of the Gleanings. Now you know, Baha'u'llah's purpose in, in writing the Iman, surely if any calls it the apology of Baha'u'llah for the Baha, it's the defense of the Bobby revelation. And they, he said that the book that Baha'u'llah wrote in Adrianople, the Kitabi Badi, which we don't have translated, but bits and pieces, but the whole thing is the longest book of revelation of Baha'u'llah. Is his defense of the Baha'i faith against the attacks of the Babis, against the Azali's comments and ideas. So there's, there's some parallel between these two. First, uh, uh, as you recall, first he set out for the for the <coughs> uncle of the Bob and for all the rest of us following the uncle. He sets out this whole picture of the plan of God through progressive revelation to draw mankind towards the goal, the ultimate goal of moving on to the next world of the sanctified soul. And uh, after laying out all those uh, those uh, basic uh, concepts and teachings, truths, if you will. He then starts in a, in a whole uh, array of proofs related to the Bible from various sources. And this section is dealing with that. So let's start off with a reading, you'll get the sense of it, and then we can talk about the details. Among the proofs demonstrating the truth of this revelation is this, that in every age and dispensation, whenever the invisible essence was revealed in the person of his manifestation, certain souls, obscure and detached from all worldly entanglements, would seek illumination from the sun of prophethood and moon of divine guidance, and would attain unto the divine presence. For this reason, the divines of the age, and those possessed of wealth, would scorn and scoff at these people, even as he hath revealed concerning them that heard. Then said the chiefs of his people who believe not, We see in thee but a man like ourselves, and we see not any who have followed thee, except our meanest ones of hasty judgment, nor see we any excellence in you above ourselves. Nay, we deem you liars. They cavilled at those holy manifestations and protested, saying, None have followed you except the abject among us, those who are worthy of no attention. Their aim was to show that no one wants to learn it. The wealthy and the renowned believed in him. By this and similar proofs, they sought to demonstrate the falsity of him that speaketh not of the truth. us into a new dimension of this. This has been mostly the history of the past. Uh, none of the well-placed, famous, powerful, influential people followed the prophets. Now it's saying this is an extraordinary dispensation that's called of the God. Can you read on with that, please? There's, if you read two paragraphs, in this most resplendent dispensation, however, this most mighty sovereignty, a number of illumined divines, of men of consummate learning, 
of doctors of mature wisdom have attained unto his court, drunk the cup of his divine presence, and been invested with the honor of his most excellent favor. They have renounced for the sake of the beloved the world and all that is therein. All these were guided by the light of the Son of Divine Revelation, confessed and acknowledged as truth. Such was their faith that most of them renounced their substance and kindred and cleave to the good pleasure of the all glorious. They laid down their lives for their well beloved and surrendered their all in his path. Their breasts were made the target, were made targets for the darts of the enemy, and their heads adorned the spears of the infidel. No land remained which did not drink the blood of these embodiments of detachment, and no sword that did not, that did not bruise their necks. Their deeds alone testify to the truth of their words. Doth not the testimony of these holy souls have so gloriously risen to offer up their lives for their beloved that the whole world marveled at the manner of their sacrifice? Suffice the people of this day? Is it not sufficient? Is it not sufficient witness against the faithless of those, the faithlessness of those who for a trife betrayed their faith, who bartered away immortality for that which perished, who gave up the kaptar of the divine presence for salty springs, and whose one aim in life is to assert the property of others? Even as thou dost witness how all of them have busied themselves with the vanities of the world and have strayed far from him who is the Lord, the Most High. From here, Paul uh, presses on with the argument. Now he's putting this to test, he's asking some questions with respect to this. Uh, do you remember the names of some of these holy souls? There's some that are right at the top, and they've been mentioned by me. Bahi, it would be, I think, the, the principal one. Hmm? Nabi, of course, has his own role, but Ojak is another one. And the third one, first, the third one. Hmm? Here's our puzzle comes along later. Of course, it's outstanding. Now I was thinking of the, of the, the three outbreaks of revolutionary Struggles that we had. It's out of my head at the moment, too, the first one. Oja, San Francisco, the Bahi, 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 some of you are strong on history. Tired, but then she wasn't among the most outstanding clergy in the country. That's the point is these are outstanding people that were recognized as authorities. And they followed the Bob and gave their lives for him. This has never happened quite in this way in, in past dispensations. So let's read this next, next paragraph, which comes to the point. Be fair. Is the testimony of those acceptable and worthy of attention, whose deeds agree with their words, whose outward behavior conforms with their inner life? The mind is bewildered at their deeds, and the soul marveled at their fortitude and bodily endurance. Or is the testimony of these faithless souls, who breathe not but the breath of selfish desire, and who lie imprisoned in the cage of their idle fancies acceptable? Like the bats of darkness, they lift not their heads from their couch, except to pursue the transient things of the world, and find no rest by night, except as they labor to advance the aims of their sordid life. Immersed in their selfish schemes, they are oblivious of the divine decree. In the daytime, they strive with all their soul after worldly benefits, and in the night season, their sole occupation is to gratify their carnal desires. By what law or standard could men be justified 
in cleaving to the denials of such petty-minded souls, and in ignoring the faith of death that are pronounced. For the sake of the good pleasure of God, their life and substance, their fame and renown, their reputation and honor. Within the Quran itself, not included here in these passages, he says, in this same argument, among them was Mullah Hussein, who became the recipient of the effulgent glory of the Son of Divine Revelation. But for him, God would not have been established upon the seat of his mercy, nor ascended the throne of eternal glory. Among them also was Sayyid Yahya, that unique and fearless figure of his age. This is Fahid himself. And then he lists a name of a number of Mullahs. And I think that well, perhaps the best known among them, among them is Mullah Ali Bastami, who together with, with Qudus was the first to be persecuted in Shiraz. And so on. You can find this passage in paragraphs 248 and again in 249. Okay, uh, let's go on with the next paper. With what love, what devotion, what exaltation and holy rapture, they sacrifice their lives in the path of your glories. To the truth of this, all witness. And yet, how can they belittle this revelation? Hath any age witnessed such momentous happenings? If these companions be not the true strivers after God, who else could be called by this name? Have these companions been seekers after power or glory? Have they ever yearned for riches? Have they cherished any desire except the good pleasure of God? If these companions, with all their marvelous testimonies and wondrous works, be false, who then is worthy to claim for himself the truth? I swear by God, their very deeds are a sufficient testimony and an irrefutable proof unto all the peoples of the earth who are meant to ponder in their hearts the mysteries of divine revelation. And they who act unjustly shall soon know what lot awaited them. In this same connection, in the same passage, a, a portion, and I'm going to read a portion from the Iqan, where Baha'u'llah asked, were not the happenings of the life of the Prince of Martyrs, that would be the Imam Hussein, regarded as the greatest of all events, as the supreme evidence of his truth, did not the people of old declare those happenings to be unprecedented? Did they not maintain that no manifestation of truth had ever been such constancy, such conspicuous glory? And here Baha'u'llah observes, he says, and yet that episode of his life, his martyrdom, in other words, commencing as it did in the morning, was brought to a close by the middle of the same day. Whereas these holy lights, the ones he's been talking about here, have for 18 years heroically endured the showers of afflictions, which from every side have rained upon them. With what love, what devotion, what exaltation, <coughs> and holy rapture, and he goes into this paragraph that we're, we just read. So that's interesting. The main the testimony from Islam was a half-day event. And think of that compared with the tremendous, far-reaching events of those early days of the Bog and his heroes. And finally, there was this last part. Consider these martyrs of unquestionable sincerity, to whose truthfulness testify the explicit text of the book, and all of whom, as thou hast witnessed, have sacrificed their life, their substance, their wives, their children, their all, 
and ascended unto the loftiest chambers of paradise. Is it fair to reject the testimony of these detached and exalted beings to the truth of this preeminent and glorious revelation, and to regard as acceptable the denunciations which have been uttered against this resplendent light by this faithless people, who for gold have forsaken their faith, and who for the sake of leadership have repudiated him who is the first leader of all mankind? This, although their character is now revealed unto all people who have recognized them as those who will in no wise relinquish one jot or one tittle of their temporal authority for the sake of God's holy faith, how much less their life, their substance, and the like. All right, friends, this dovetails very beautifully, I think, with the presentation of Shastra and Shant San Shan yesterday, where they talked about what should be our response, what action should arise from our consideration of the lives of the dog herders. And they have these five points which are very well taken. I won't go into that again. I wanted now to supplement this with two other passages from the Agon that are not here in this particular collection, but related to it. of the gleanings uh, that Shavikandi has translated from Baha'u'llah. These points are reiterated and uh, expanded a bit. And I wanted to share that with you. And since there can be no tie of direct intercourse to bind the one true God with his creation, and no resemblance whatever can exist between the transient and the eternal, the contingent and the absolute. He has ordained that in every age a dis and dispensation a pure and stainless soul be made manifest in the kingdoms of earth and heaven. Under this subtle, this mysterious and ethereal being, he hath assigned a twofold nature. The physical pertaining to the world of matter and the spiritual which is born of the substance of God himself. He hath moreover conferred upon him a double station, the first station which is related to his innermost reality, representeth him as one whose voice is the voice of God himself. To this testifieth the tradition, manifold and mysterious is my relationship with God. I am he himself, and he is I, myself, except that I am that I am, and he is that he is. And in like manner the words, Arise, O Muhammad, for lo, the lover and the beloved are joined together and made one in thee. He similarly saith, There is no distinction whatsoever between thee and them, except that they are thy servants. The second station is the human station, exemplified by the following verses. I am but a man like you. Say, praise be to my Lord. Am I more than a man, an apostle? These essences of detachment, these resplendent realities, are the channels of God's all-pervasive grace led by the light of unfailing guidance and invested with supreme sovereignty. They are commissioned to use the inspiration of their words, the effusions of their infallible grace, and the sanctifying breeze of their revelation for the cleansing of every longing heart and receptive spirit from the dross and dust of earthly cares and limitations. Then and only then will the trust of God, latent in the reality of man, emerge as resplendent as the rising orb of divine revelation from behind the veil of concealment 
and implant the ensign of its revealed glory upon the summits of men's hearts. Well, I'm giving us a summary again of the themes of the Islam and with new words. This passage continues. By the way, let me give you the number on that so you can find it within yourself. This is passage 27 of the Gleanings. And it's paragraphs 4 and 5 of that particular selection. From the foregoing passages and allusions, it hath been made indubitably clear that in the kingdoms of earth and heaven, there must needs be manifested a being, an essence who shall act as a manifestation and vehicle for the transmission of the grace of the divinity himself, itself, sorry, the sovereign Lord of all. Through the teachings of this day star of truth, every man will advance and develop until he attaineth the station at which he can manifest all the potential forces with which his inmost true self has been endowed. It is for this very purpose that in every age and dispensation the prophets of God and his chosen ones have appeared amongst men and have evinced such power as is born of God and such might as only the eternal can reveal. Reinforcing the section about the appearance, the nature, and character of the essence of existence, that is God Himself. Uh, passage number 20, selection number 20 from the Galenians, that is a short paragraph which reviews that for us in fresh words. Know thou with certainty that the unseen can in no wise incarnate His essence and reveal it unto men. He is and hath ever been immensely exalted beyond all that can either be recounted or perceived. From his retreat of glory, his voice is ever proclaiming, Verily, I am God. There is none other God besides me, the all-knowing, the all-wise. I have manifested myself unto men, and have sent down him who is the dayspring of the signs of my revelation. Through him I have caused all creation to testify that there is none other God except him, the incomparable, the all-informed, the all-wise. He who is everlastingly hidden from the eyes of men can never be known except through his manifestation. And his manifestation can induce no greater proof of the truth of his mission than the proof of his own person. In parallel passages to this, uh, Baha'u'llah states very clearly, he said, the proof, first proof of the manifestation is the person of the manifestation himself. That's the greatest proof he can induce. Now, we, we, didn't, we don't have access to that. We will have in the world to come, but here we haven't seen him. So after that remains, he said, two other proofs. One is the power of revelation. That is the power to reveal. The, that power that we were, I was uh, referring to, suggesting with the stories about how Baha'u'llah uh, would uh, excuse the friends from his presence when he was revealing, because of that power of revelation. That's one of the proofs of the Bob talks about it too. Independent of the content of the Word of God is the power to do that. Stream thousands and thousands of verses. So in 24 hours, the equivalent of a Quran will come out of the mouth of the manifestation in this day. That's an extraordinary kind of power of revelation. Then he said the third proof is the content of the Word of God. That is what it says. That's basically the one we're left with. We have stories about people. We haven't witnessed this revelation itself. And we haven't seen the manifestation, although we do have in this day, for the first time, we have an image of it. And uh, that's a, a blessed event. I think we, uh, 
the first time I saw the portrait of Baha'u'llah, I was so struck that he was human. <laughs> you know, you all your life, you, for years, you're preparing for this, and then suddenly there he is, he's a man, with eyebrows and nose, and, <laughs> and yet that penetrating look on his, on his face. I oftentimes wondered if that look, which is a, usually strikes people as fairly severe and stern, is because the government has put him in a chair and taken his picture, you know? <laughs> it's taking his picture for whatever purpose, passport, or they didn't have passports like that in those days. But, but also the very dignity, almost all of the portraits you see of the early believers, they have. They don't smile, that was too frivolous. <laughs> Every time we take a picture, we say, yeah, smile, or make a funny face, or do something. So, this is not quite the standard that's there amongst the manifestation and his followers, immediate followers. So those are the three groups, interesting, interesting enough. Now, Baha'u'llah in himself, he talks about uh, in the Akdas, Kitabi Akdas, 